back. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Well, everybody, no one left, but you know. We're back on camera at least, right? Yeah, that's true. So, or welcome I if you uh, I to start that today. Gave yourself like a reminder specifically for this this presentation. Mm -hmm. You're excited about this, and I know you've been talking about this, and you've been excited to see these guys what they're doing. I really am. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be a good one, and like I said, they've got a lot of information to share with you all. They work in many different ways, many different sectors of businesses. So uh, it's going to be really good for you all. So again, if you got questions coming through, Jessica and I will do our best to throw them their direction. So and then be uh, mindful. Obviously, the team wants to show specific things to you guys to make sure they're getting all the information they want to share with you. So we'll have to try and find spots to ask questions that you guys might be asking if you have any. But enough me. Let's get going. Let's bring in Pitch Dev Studios. Let's go. Hey. Hi, guys. <laughs> well, hello. Hey. I love hello. it. I love your Eve. Look at that lighting. Look at that lighting you got going on I know. On it's there. a completely beautiful setup. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I, I, I think those those are the spaceship right now. That I took from a different dimension. I just put them over there. <laughs> the two tesseracts. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I you know I like that movie. I'm a fan of that movie. I enjoyed Oblivion. I thought it was a good movie. I thought it was a great movie too. I did. Yeah. yeah, I thought it was a great movie. I thought it was fantastic. I watched. I've watched it several times. So I really enjoyed. It. Well, thank you guys for both being here and taking some time out of your days. I know you're you're in uh, Jerusalem, so it's a different time zone for you, David. You're on the East Coast. Um, I just like to share that kind of stuff too, because this just shows how cool we can be, how worldly we can do this, right? And have everyone streaming from different areas of the world. It's been a lot of fun. So um, I really appreciate you guys taking time out of your evening and out in the middle of your day, David, to be with us and share what you guys are looking to share. And I know you got a bunch of little items to share along the way here, uh, things that you're going to share with the community, not just only a presentation, but other items that are going to be dropped mm -hmm. in this presentation as well some other goodies for so sure. thank you so much for being here but well, thanks for having us i mean for us it's uh we thank you yari for bringing that together that's that's awesome thank you uh but for us it's really like uh we're huge geeks and fans uh of zebrush so for us it's a dream come true thank you so much absolutely well uh, we'll get started. Who uh, who needs the screen first again? Is it David, right? Well, I think we're supposed to show a video um, okay. yeah, of that's our right. reel. Yep. So we're going to start with that so people know exactly what Pitch Tough Studio is about. And then I'll do a quick explanation of what our company is about. Sure. Absolutely. Okay, if you're not excited, I, I, don't, I don't know what to say. You got to be yeah. excited now after that. Here we go. And uh, and that's a really a small sample of what's going on in our company because, of course, a lot of the stuff we're doing, a lot of the big projects we're working on are still under wrap. And because it's concept art, we work usually kind of two years before they're even put on screen. You know? Um, but that gives an idea of a little bit of uh, what, we, what we are. We're a concept art company. And usually what we do is that we're hired by by, uh, by by studios and we're kind of like uh, we put SWAT teams of artists together in order to customize um, and specifically 
attack a certain set of problems uh, uh, on, a, on a project. So for example, if project is stylized or, or uh, hyper real, or for example, we do a lot of industrial design work as well, whatever the project is needs, we put together a team of experts in that very specific field for a very specific style. That's what we usually do. So here we go. And our, our projects span, like I say, everything, films, video games, uh, industrial design, uh, and more things. Yeah. So here we go. OK. Do you want your screen up, David, right? Uh, sure, yes. So actually, uh, I'm not going to start with ZBrush. I'm going to start with this presentation. So these are my two girls. So I just wanted a shout out to my girls, which I'm whom I love very, very much. They are school right now. I think about you. <laughs> so, uh, 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 so this is me, this is my face here and there. Uh, so uh, I have uh, 25 years of experience in, um, in uh, entertainment. I studied industrial design and architecture. I've been, uh, I was in video games for 15 years, and then I switched to uh, uh, feature films. The first, first movie I worked on was uh, Tron, uh, Tron Legacy. <laughs> so, and uh, I mentioned what PDS is about. So the type of projects I have worked on and the company is transitioning into is in video games, we worked on Assassin's Creed, Prison of Persia, Prometheus. I worked on Avatar 2, 3, 4, Tron Legacy and those games, Spectral. Uh, the ones that are in red, uh, uh, Finch and Black Adam, I really wish we could talk about them today, but because we're under NDA, we can't really go into that. But Finch is going to be um, um, av available for viewing on Apple TV Plus in uh, two weeks. And that's a movie that I highly recommend because, uh, first of all, it's the first big AAA movie our company worked on. Uh, and it's really, in terms of the story, I think it's it's very powerful and uh, very timely. Uh, and Black Adam, we can't even let's talk about this because this is two years away from here. Uh -huh. So uh, but this is the, these are the kind of projects we worked on. So I'm going to talk today. Uh, oh, this is for later. Uh, correct or is it fun? No, it's yeah, for it's, for, it's okay. related for later. It's the case study. You can do it now. Yeah. I can, uh, yeah. You have nothing further to say. Yeah, go ahead. No, I have uh, nothing further to say. Uh, okay, great. Into I, it. I, yeah, that's good. It's perfect transition actually, because uh, we were supposed to talk about like why we use ZBrush, uh, and I think it's a perfect uh, uh, segue into showing a project, uh, project that uh, we worked on, like Suicide Squad. Uh, and how ZBrush was integrated into uh, part of uh, uh, bringing that vision to life. So these are the kind of references that as concept artists we received from the production designer. Um, so here on this project, I was uh, working under the supervision of uh, uh, Beth uh, Mikkel, uh, who was a production designer, and she sends like tons and tons of images, and she sends like sketches. Uh, uh, and in, in, in this instance, it was about the main building design uh, for um, uh, for Jotunheim, where uh, start, where I don't want to give any any uh, if for people who hasn't who haven't seen it, where there's like horrible things happening underneath. Here we go, uh, and this is kind of the first sketch that uh, uh, I created uh, based on the references that were given to me. It's supposed to be a bunker. We weren't sure yet where the bunker was located. <laughs> But uh, uh, this is the kind of stuff that's perfect to do in ZBrush, you know, where uh, we just I just take a and environment is really about that. He's making iconic shapes based on sometimes primitives, but also finding the right proportions. I believe that design is all about proportions, and uh, working with booleans for me uh, uh, really was a freeing factor. When ZBrush came up with the boolean system, that was so fast. I mean it. it right away, there was no hesitation. I jumped right away into using it in the pipeline. Um, because on those kind of projects, speed is of the essence. You know, we have to work fast. Uh, we have to deliver constantly and as fast as possible all the time. And to be able to move objects around in Boolean in real time, just it's just a game changer for me, for us. And this is just to show what the final result in the movie looked like. Uh, based on the designs. Uh, I, I, I mean, I could spend hours on this, of course, because this is just one iteration of the design I showed you. As you know, I mean, as you guys know, just Jessica and Paul, there's like hundreds of versions before something is released, you know. But uh, it, it's a good way of showing from concept, from the reference through concept, uh, throwing uh, also what it looks like once it's finally composited in the movie by the VFX guys, and then uh, uh, what it looks like when it's built, uh, when the set is built. 
So I'm going to go fast because I know it's a short moment that I'm doing for the case study. Uh, this shows again, uh, so of course, uh, uh, when it comes to doing architecture and things like that, very often I still use the, my usual softwares to set up rendering in V-Ray and things like that. But when it comes to props, because of the Booleans, once again, that explains why uh, we're going to show what we're going to show later. I mean, it becomes such a fast process that I started veering off my usual software more and more because I found myself saving so much time uh, using ZBrush. So all the props that are in there, I'd say that uh, more than half of the props that are in there, actually, I did in ZBrush, whether, of course, it's the more logical ones, so like the pipes on the ground, but also like the, the, the screen things I'm going to show. Uh, the obvious suspects, which I call radial symmetry, the simulation master and key shot, uh, in order to get the concept very quickly from 3D modeling all the way to rendering. And so this is a prop I did, obviously, pretty fast in ZBrush. And this is when it's integrated in the in an environment in V-Ray, uh, rendered in V-Ray, that's what it would look like. The same the arms. I mean, I use some kit bash elements. I use some uh, uh, some things that I model myself. These are the kind of props that usually would have taken me much more time. Uh, I mean, especially in other softwares where booleans were just completely non-existent or too slow. Uh, uh, these are the kind of sketches really that I can do very quickly in ZBrush. Use decimation master and then uh, uh, quickly set them up together, rendered in Keyshot here but then set up into a 3D model like here, very quickly using a mood in order to create a, an environment and an emotion. This was one of the iterations of the secret underground. Same goes here. Most of the props here were done in ZBrush and then set, set, I set them up into a, a, my three software to render in V-Ray. Same here, you can probably easy to see the technique. Knowing Paul, he probably knows exactly how I built all this stuff in two seconds. So, and that's the other thing is that, I, I mean, when I see Paul work, or when I see all, all the guys ZBrush work, I mean, they're really experts in my eyes. And, and I try to gather some of the information that they throw on YouTube. And I try to understand exactly their process. Uh, but, uh, uh, and that's where using Booleans for me was nice and easy because it, it doesn't require necessarily to be an expert in the software or ZBrush. It, it's something that you can pick up very, very easily and do very quickly uh, some uh, interesting uh, volumes and shapes. And, and these, are all, a, these are all yeah. V-Ray renders. That's yes, these are all V-Ray renders, all v -ray. correct. And you're doing V-Ray in, in Maya or Max? In or Max. Max. In Max. In Max. And, yeah. Coming from video games, uh, that's the software yeah. I'm the best. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and now with all the banks of textures you can get, get you know, through a quick sale or order, you know, it makes the process very fast. And Keyshot as well, of course, you know. And all these elements built with uh, Booleans, I mean, are just so fun to do. That, that's the thing that it brought for me when it comes to 3D modeling, is fun. <clears throat> So this is an example, typical example of something I do in ZBrush <coughs> very rapidly using the knife, uh, um, to cut a knife and using, once I have that base like this, using really primitive, I'm not a topology kind of guy. I just go there like a butcher. I just, I'm a, I'm a polygon killer, okay? I don't care, I don't have feelings for polygons. I'm sorry for those who do, but my goal is to get a concept right away from the beginning all the way to the end rendered. Uh, so the way I would do here, is that I decided to create like a, a stamp, uh, a Boolean stamp, because I didn't want to place every single button on those consoles. And so what I did is I created a Boolean for that. And then I would just have to move the Boolean around and create the screen integrated, all the, already with the buttons, already with the handles, everything without me having to worry about it. And this is kind of the result they would give uh, once built uh, by the team and lit and things like that. So you can see here coming from the concept art, the lighting, elements of texturing, elements of modeling, of course, uh, that uh, create overall and mood and atmosphere for a set that is built later by the whole team. So here we go. That's my quick, super quick uh, kind of a view into what it is to use ZBrush inside a movie uh, for a AAA feature film. And when, you, when you're doing these, are you baking anything in your render or are you just decimating the models and throwing them in V-Ray or Max to render with V-Ray? Uh, 
Well, it depends. When I have to set up renderings just in Keyshot for to send to a, a set designer, for example, I don't even decimate. When it comes to uh, bringing into uh, um, 3ds Max, 3ds Max is actually really good at handling a large amount of polygons. Um, uh, so I I do decimate, but usually I'm I mostly decimate so I can separate between all the subtools, and I can apply materials. For me, I mean management of materials is very important, and I do that through subtools. And when I do my booleans, which is why it's great, is that I can retain all my polygroup. And when I flatten my, my 3D object, it has all the separated elements for materials. Then I just import it. And more and more, what we've been using as a tool for rendering uh, is actually, actually has been unreal. Uh, unreal. And for that, yes, decimation becomes more of a question uh, because obviously of uh, different limitation counts. Uh, but uh, Unreal has become really for us like a kind of a go-to rendering system as well. So here we go. Thank you. So I think uh, we're on to Yariv now. Yes, we are. On to Yariv. Okay. Which which one uh, which which one would you like to share? This one. There you go. They got you. Hey everybody, how you doing? Pleasure to meet you guys. Um, this is a little presentation of an introduction of myself and how I came in contact with ZBrush. I've been using it for quite a while. Um, this over here is just a starter for my little slideshow I built in ZBrush. Um, you know, if you guys will take a good look, this is using our Boolean kit. Oh, sorry. Let's go back. Oops. I don't know what's going on. Oh, the space mouse. So embarrassing. So yeah, this is using our Boolean kit. And this is for a little bit later on in our presentations when we, uh, I pass it over to, to David, he'll pass it back to me. I'll show you guys some cool stuff. But you take a good look at this because we got some bevels happening on these Booleans, you guys. So stay tuned for that. So let's start from the beginning. So I got a shout out to my family. Oops, sorry, page down button. So this is my family. We are a ZBrush family. What do I mean by that? We have a cosmic relationship with ZBrush that three of my children have actually been born on the release dates of specific releases of ZBrush. Four, four or two, and then all the other ones were born within a week of release, and Paul can attest to that. So we are a ZBrush family. So, you know, 2021 was really, really great. Uh, she was born with some uh, really cool features here. She has two different color eyes. I guess one half is like a third is brown. Um, I have a, uh, that's my lovely wife. Without this, I couldn't do anything. I'll tell you, these kids are a handful. I uh, somehow think that if it was them as opposed to the Avengers at the end of Infinity War, they would have got that gauntlet off of them. <laughs> <laughs> I would have just, I would have just told this one, I would have just told, you know, 2019 over here. I would have said, hey, those are candy. They would have totally gotten it off his hands. Anyways, so I have one of them over here. The uh, greatest thing that happened to us in 2020, I mean, it was a tough year for everybody, and I just have to say that without my good friend David keeping me positive and keeping me working and, you know, keeping things going for me, it would have been a, it's been a very a much harder time. But one of the best things that came out of Pixel Logic in 2020 was the release of ZBrush Core Mini. And I have one person in my family who is a potential ZBrusher, you guys. This is, she's 12 years old, and this is her first model ever. Now, so cool. I, I, I must tell you, she asks me for critiques, and I give it to her. I just said, you just can't rely on those vector displacement brushes because those brushes are just, you gotta learn how to sculpt. She's like, I just wanna sculpt. So I, you know, you're probably wondering, why doesn't she use ZBrush? Well, we tried that a couple times. She has two reasons why she doesn't, really likes ZBrush. She likes ZBrush Core Mini. Um, she wants to get ZBrush Core for her bot mitzvah. So we'll see after this movie if I can get her. Now I hear it's on sale. So um, <laughs> two reasons. Number one, she doesn't like edit mode because she keeps like dropping out of edit mode. And then I have to run across the room and you know hit control and bring it back to the canvas. She doesn't like that. And number two is a bit more of a uh, technical reason. She sees all these language choices and she wonders why Yiddish is not on there. And I'm thinking in my head, they're gonna get Klingon and parcel tongue in there before they get Yiddish. So 
<laughs> Let me just make sure my booleans are off. Okay. So a little bit about, so I was uh, born in this uh, city of um, Beersheba. And when I was very little, uh, we resided in uh, Los Angeles. And um, it was there that I grew my passion for, for films, for mainly Westerns and sci-fi films. Those were, those were my passion. And after senior year, I just wanted to sit that whole summer and play video games and watch movies. And my mother, she's this uh, hairstylist, she's from Morocco, speaks with a French accent, says, don't be a consumer, go be a producer, make money. And she I, appro that. I approve this French accent. <laughs> Thank you, David. Oh, yeah. So she works in the Burbank Glendale area. And um, a lot of guys from Digital Domain would go over there. And so she got me an internship um, out of high school at Digital Domain. Now, I must tell you, this was very interesting. I thought I was gonna get to make the graphics and everything like that. No, like Mike and Sully from Monsters Inc. I started in the mailroom. And, you know, I hope to be a top scarer one day, but it didn't happen that way. Because back then in the early 2000s, um, when I would go over there and take a look at the um, CG department, the modelers would build these models like point by point and make a polygon and point. By, and I was like, I can't believe it. I was like asking this guy who's building a character like vertice by vertice. I'm like, how are you been working on this character? He goes, man, it's been like two weeks and I'm only on the nose. I'm like, keep going. But I asked like, isn't there a more organic way to actually create content? They said, there isn't. You know, you gotta just, you know, either use a soup of polygons or use these things called nerves. And I was just like, not for me. But um, what happened when I was there is a very important thing. The talk of the town those days, was this gentleman. Now, many of you on Zebra Central who have been here for a while know this artist. His name is Taryn. And he left the industry, I think in 2014. Um, but this guy was the talk of the town. And I um, reached out to him through his website. And I said, listen, it's the summer. I'm you know, interning at Digital Domain. And I see your work and it looks amazing. Is there a chance that you could show me how you do what you're doing? And he said, sure, come on over for, you know, come on over for dinner. So I can't, I, I was shocked. He said, I'll show you whatever you want to see, give you as much time as I can on one condition that one day when somebody has this much enthusiasm and energy, you help them out too. So we'll see how that plays out. So he showed me when I asked him, is there a, like an organic way to create content like models like you do? And at the time there really wasn't, you had subdivision surfaces and displacement. And that's what, he, that's what he was doing, very cleverly built subdivision surface models and he was using his place, but he had version 1.5 of ZBrush and it didn't look anything like it does today, you guys. Um, and he showed me this cool motorcycle that I believe O'Fair built. And that was before, uh, you know, a ray mesh or anything like that. I don't exactly know how he built that. I think he just put a bunch of, they didn't even have sub tools. So, um, I was pretty impressed, but he said that you can't take this data outside of ZBrush. It just lives in ZBrush. There was no, there was no way at the time to like generate displacement maps or anything like that would come much later. And it did. But the second thing that happened to me at Digital Domain that summer, besides meeting Taryn, was another guy who I'm not going to mention right now. I'm going to save him for the Boolean presentation. But this guy um, is amazing. Um, as I went, this was about two days before I was supposed to leave Digital Domain. My internship was ending, and these guys, arts, these artists in our um, CG department, went out to lunch with this guy. And as I was walking out, I saw that he had a portfolio. He had creatures and character designs and vehicles. And I was like, I want to know how you did this and where you learned how to do that. And he said he went to Art Center College of Design. And at that point, I knew where I had to go next. And I went to Art Center College of Design. And I know a lot of my fellow alumni are watching this stream. And um, to them, I say, hail Hydra. Um, the Art Center College of Design is a great school. Um, at the time, there was no, like, schoolism. There was no uh, brainstorm. In fact, the, one of the guys that created Brainstorm, James, uh, he was my classmate. So nothing ex existed. We had the DVD, and that was it. So, okay, I'm at eight minutes now. So I'm gonna just take a few minutes and kind of just run through this. So um, Neville Page was uh, my teacher at Art Center. So the best thing that I can show you guys that uh, came out of Art Center was what I call the Four Musketeers. 
and that was Scott Roberts and Neville Page, Roy Bustos, and the late Norm Sherman. So if I can say a little bit about each of these guys, um, I'd like to say that Scott um, was by far none the guy who gave me my foundation and my base in drawing and design and thinking laterally uh, as a gift to the entire ZBrush community. Design Studio Press is giving a 20% discount on his two books, How to Draw and How to Render, which are must-gets, and Ray Bustos' Anatomy book. I would definitely check those out. But Neville Page made the most impact at me at Art Center, and he tends to stick, uh, you know, I tend to stick him into some of the stuff that I do, and he created a character over here of, uh, let's see if I can just click this one over here. This character is called Yariv. It appears in Star Trek Picard. <laughs> but what I gained from him was a really good understanding of how to use research effectively, how to actually take the research, how to understand it, how to digest it, how to include story behind everything that you're designing. So it was the summer of 2004, I had to share the love. I got to see ZBrush version 2.0 and I was blown away. It could export displacement maps and Taryn was doing crazy stuff at the time. So I, you know, Neville invited me over to the studio that he shared with Scott and we geeked out over ZBrush. And uh, this was a model he created the very next week. This character appears in the Star Trek 2000, uh, 2008 film. And it's, a, it's really cool. I got to see how he applied all those traditional things that he was talking about in his background to this point. And then years later, he built this other character called Dex. And I was always wondering whatever happened to these characters. And when I was invited to Bad Robot to do a demo, there they are sitting on JJ Abrams shelf. So <laughs> I thought that was really cool. So. Let me just go a little bit forward here in my slideshow. After college, I went to Art Center College of Design. Uh, she, after college, I went to this company called Cafe FX. At the time, there wasn't a lot of hiring going on for concept artists coming out because it was just too new of a thing. You had to kind of make your own curriculum as you would go. Um, that I, this was an amazing company to work for because of two reasons. They brought over two of the most amazing artists I've ever had a chance to work with. That's, if you guys know, that's Chris Costa and that's, Greg Jontaikis, and he's gonna be an amazing director. I hope he gets an Emmy for his work on his latest, latest Netflix project that he did. But working with these guys, being that small fish in that big pond, it's just a humbling feeling. And I get that feeling at Pitch Dev. So it's really, really great to kind of grow and learn from these amazing people. So with that said, paying it forward, it's the last thing I'm gonna talk about. These are some of the people that I've mentored over the years, and I haven't mentored that many people. But Frederick Storm, William Lambeth, this guy who linger in who is, you know, he's yet to post his work on ZBC, but God willing soon. He actually is a, he actually is unique because he'd never used 3D before or drawn before. And this is his first 3D model, this Funko Pop model that he made. And I was pretty impressed with it right out the gates. Um, but my PS de resistance was Joe Grunsfast. Now I put something in here for Jessica Drew. Jessica, I'm sure you recognize or might recall that image. That's from the 2016 Sculpt Off, where Joe finished as the runner up to the champion, Fury Tadeshi. But the reason it's I say so this, good. yeah, it was really cool. The reason I say this, why it's important to pay it forward is because I told Joe when I mentored him through this project, let's give this model away for free. And we put it on ZBrush Central. Ten thousand downloads later, uh, wow. you know he he finds himself working on this film called the you know the Avengers: Age of Ultron. It was kind of cool because he called me in a panic on this show, and I kind of helped him using ZProject to kind of build this model. Uh, they were dealing with manifold ge non manifold geometry. So the thing that these guys all have in common, the guys that I mentored, with the exceptions of Mo Langerman, is that they all made the top row in ZBrush Central. As we say in Yiddish, that's the Halaga position. That's like the highest honor you can get. I say post your work up, you know, wait till you're ready to, wait till it's really good, but post your work up on Zero Central. You never know when you're gonna end up working on the next Marvel movie and he didn't either. So, cast the mic back to David. All right, cool. thanks, Harry. I wanna say, first of all, that I'm blown away that Yari did this whole presentation in ZBrush. <laughs> I just want to point that out. I don't know if you guys realize, but this slideshow was made entirely in ZBrush. And my hat's off to you for that. Oh, yeah. really cool. Somebody was commenting that in the comments. They're like, wait, you're doing a slideshow in ZBrush right now? Yeah. That, that is something that should be really straight out of the box. I, I want to learn how to do that big time. Yeah. So, OK, so should we? So do you want me to do the Boolean demo now, Yariv? 
Um, uh, do you want to do, we... do you want to do essence of sci-fi first, or do you want to go right to the bullying demos? What do you feel? Well, yes, the sci-fi is real fast. I, but it's say? on your screen. But it's on your screen, correct? Correct. Do you want to do essence of sci-fi now, or do you want to do bullions? Well, let, let's do some three D a little bit, and then we switch back to storytelling. And then, we'll talk about that and then I'll, and I'll, okay, cool. Yeah, that sounds like a good, uh, like a good rhythm. So, okay, okay, so based on everything that I said earlier on regarding bullions, I'm going to show you a little bit. Once again, I'm not like uh, all those uh, uh, the guys like Paul and all those amazing artists using ZBrush. I'm more, once again, a polygon butcher. But uh, I'm going to show you how even being a polygon, polygon butcher, how you can really get something really quick when it comes to hard surface in ZBrush. So here we go. Here, I'm just starting with the polymesh cube using I think symmetry. Could be a teacher, polygon butcher. <laughs> that, that is it. When you name the tool knife, I mean, how can you not? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. He's that's come up true. with a couple of zingers besides Polygon, but you said a couple other ones. Like, that's great. <laughs> I, I need to uh, to become a comedian. No, really, I don't. <laughs> I'm joking. So, and using so this is kind of the the kit that uh, we put together, and it's a kit of around a little more than eighty uh, uh, very optimized uh, shapes, and those shapes are the kind of shapes that I use basic, on a daily basis when I do hard surface. And, uh, and it doesn't matter what type of hard surface. You know, there's a language that, uh, that we develop as artists, uh, and there are shapes that we use that are based on many different influences. I would say that a lot of my influences come from uh, Japanese uh, uh, animation, uh, whether it's uh, 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 sci-fi Japanese animation or, or anything that has cool vehicles, you know, basically. Uh, and uh, I use those shapes. I developed a bank of them. And uh, of course, you can mix and match, use all the shapes. And from there, what I do is that I use uh, I use Dynamesh simply, you know. I'm gonna duplicate this so we can keep a track of it. I use Dynamesh, and the amount of detail that I use is gonna kind of tell me the amount of uh, uh, softening between the objects, and that's something that of that Yari is gonna show later. There is some really cool stuff. Uh, happening uh, with ZBrush that allow much more control than that. But this is a technique that I've been using until now. And uh, do this. David, can I interject something real quick? Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, please. I just want to say, um, if it hasn't been said before, uh, we have this Boolean kit that we're making. And we, as a gift to the, to the, to the top 10 finishers of the Sculpt Off, whoever wins it, you guys will get a free, both of our kits, the basic kit and the jet kit. Super and then, yeah, and then and then once uh, once I have my basic model, what I do is that I start digging in there, you know, and uh, there's tons of little detail gag stuff that you can add, you know. But you can also go more bold, which is kind of fun too, which I love doing. And what I do, I, you notice that I split my uh, my uh, mask my uh, mask object regularly. And that allows me, because ahead of time, I kind of know what I'm going to do with my materials, you know? And if anybody has any questions. Don't... They're asking where they get the, the brush. So that kit is on our gum road. Um, uh, so you can so access it on our gum road. And we have. Yeah, okay. yeah, we can. Okay, I, I know that Kyle, so, Kyle has a link. Uh, right, okay, cool. And we have, uh, for the viewers of this show, we actually have 20% off uh, our brushes. Uh, yeah, they're putting it up right now. So you got to use the coupon code to the summit. And it's, and it's only for the first 50, correct? People correct. that use that code, getting 20% yeah. off. I created that code. It's cool. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Joking. <laughs> so here we go. So uh, so that's kind of the basics of the technique. 
And then when, uh, when you're ready, of course, you know, uh, first of all, uh, Keyshot, the latest version of Keyshot does handle Booleans. So you can actually export straight those Booleans into Keyshot. Uh, mm -hmm. Here I'm using eight, uh, it doesn't have that. Uh, but uh, you can see right away that uh, once you transfer your model uh, uh, directly, and like I said, when I work in Max or Unreal, I tend to go and be less of a butcher, and I will, I will handle myself a little better, uh, and I will clean up the model a little bit, you know. <laughs> but uh, but in general, I go straight into Keyshot and uh, apply a material. That material, by the way, is given as well uh, in our kit, um, uh, and you can very quickly have a good idea of a design uh, by applying specific materials to specific areas. As you can see here in my scene, I have all those elements separated uh, on their own. So here we go. So that's kind of the basics. So how does that apply to more complex stuff? Well, I mean, after that, it's really a question of scaling up the, the same technique. So let's say we have a jet, you know. Uh, I did that jet very, very quickly uh, uh, using a using the same technique I just showed you, which is applying some volumes. We have another kit for that, which is the jet kit, obviously, uh, that has a bunch of different parts that you can add to the jet, like really crazy, crazy size wheel like this, because it looks good. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> ship it. Ship and, it uh, <laughs> it kind of actually looked pretty cool. It's almost like cartoony. Like, like <laughs> exactly. Vibe. It looks kind of like a, it's a, it has a chicken vibe. Yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> you got to so, have fun when you're doing the designs, right? It, it's correct. Yeah. And then from there, you know, uh, you do use exactly the same technique. You go into your, your folder and you can apply Booleans and then apply all the positive objects like... Uh, so the beginning base was just a Dynamesh, and it looks like you just started adding a spherical shapes you stretched and then Dynameshed it together. That is and exactly now you've right. you've got a secondary right. sub tool. Yeah, and actually, parts. that's correct. And actually, the way I start now, because I have so many of those uh, uh, brushes already organized and things like that, is that I can start with, uh, with a Polymesh 3D. I select the model that I want. For example, I want to do like a more uh, maybe a realistic jet. You know, this is a private jet, so I'm going to move this. Boom. And here we go. I have the basis of a private jet that's already built. That's there. And then from there, I'll take some wings, you know, different style of wings. Oh, it's rotated, so I'm going to have to rotate it. Yeah, this is definitely a case of working smarter, not harder. Well, the thing is, that's a, that's a perfect explanation because once again, I mean, the type of pressures that we're under when it comes to massive projects, you know, it's a it's a whole different story we, when we have to, oops, what I did. Oh, because uh, of the the point where it's located. Let's try this one. Because of the, of the pressure that we have to face in uh, in uh, on big projects, you know, sometimes we just don't have the time to, to we, the more prepared we are, the better, basically, you know, here. The chicken mode again. <laughs> well, but also these are shapes that, um, you know, you have a really nice version that you know that works in your system. So you don't have to troubleshoot anything. You're just getting it in and you can alter the shape based on um, maybe some of the reference that they sent you or make it really wild, but it still harkens back to something that they know and already understand. That's exactly that right. That's the, and it's really... Be, the kit was meant to be very simplified. Like... Um, we're also, I guess I can talk about it now. We're also doing an automotive kit. Everything there is very generic. Everything there is not specific because we don't know what you're going to design with it. So the more generic we make this, these kits, the, the more effective they'll be when somebody uses them. When they buy like a brush kit that has all the details already in it, great. But, you know, you can, you can now create your own stuff as opposed to, you know, oh, I've seen that detail before. That's Vitaly's, you know, IMM, you know. Yeah, and, and and there's nothing wrong with those kits as well. I mean, I yeah, I, I, I personally I personally use Vitaly's kit, you know, because yeah. uh, no, I'm, I'm his first fan. Uh, but uh, but but there's also something good to be said about uh, having the flexibility to choose your own design based on objects that already have great proportions to start with. And like I mentioned earlier, on, when you have great basic proportions, then it's much easier for you to do those modifications and to make them your own. You know, that's kind of the idea. 
So how do you handle scale for big models like this, buildings and airplanes? Do you typically so, unify with deformations? Are you worried about it at all? So and that's, a, that's also a great question because to me, the, the, the things that when I sketch on, pen, on, on paper, mm -hmm. I don't worry about the scale. Sure. You know, I think about the scale when I start having to uh, uh, exchange that that uh, piece of art with other uh, people, you know. But when uh, you and that's why I use very often um, I remove perspective when I do my designs because I like to be in non-perspective so that I keep objectivity. And the hardest thing in design is to keep objectivity for a long period of time. And that's why being able to go very fast at the sketching time allows you for more objectivity in the quality of your design. Uh, I'd say that that's that's why I don't worry about scale at first. I look at references, yes. I look at photos maybe of a private jet or something like that to make sure that the scale, it, it, the, the relational scale, the relative scale between objects is correct. But other than that, I don't worry about scale at first. And then when I start getting into more micro, I go from micro to micro. And when I go into micro, that's when uh, I, I'm more careful about the scale and how it relates to how it's going to be next to the scale of a human or other objects. I guess that's, I would say that's the process. So, yeah, so that, that's kind of, that's kind of the idea, you know? Mm -hmm. okay. And then, like you say, I do a dyna mesh and then I apply uh, uh, other objects that can be more detail oriented, you know, like, uh, like those, you know, and <laughs> you can go as crazy as you want. I, okay, let's be honest. The reason why I like the technique is that it, it brings me back to being a kid and doing model kits. Here you go. I'm going to yeah. be very honest. There's that sense of having everything is ready. My table is ready. I have all my, all my I'm going to sound like so immature, but it is the reality of it. When we design, we want to go back to that mindset of being a kid and jumping into uh, uh, model kit making, having all the shapes that you already love, that you already know, that you that you experienced before, and you have less of a pressure of being hit by the blank canvas as well. So, so here we go. Yeah, let's you that, just try some things on for size and see how it fits and feels. Th that's exactly right. Yeah. So here we go. That's the kind of technique I wanted to show and how it applies to uh, to um, to uh, basically doing designs for any kind of uh, uh, platform. You know. Can we show them the render of the jet? Uh, sure, yeah. Actually, I probably, probably have it somewhere. So you always start with going in a key shot to um, figure out the design, if it's working and everything for you? Uh, I, I, no, I mean, I, have a, I love the materials in ZBrush because they're very simple. And when they are very simple, they force you to to make sure that your design is good. I try to not look at materials too too early because then it kind of affects your judgment. Uh, and material is such a big statement, you know. When you have a material and an object, I mean, I, I'm very careful by the way I present like a, a materials to uh, a production designers or or director because if you apply the wrong material to the to to the right object, the the design may be uh, shut down. You know, so I would say that I turn to I tend to go into materials once I, there's a level of happiness I have in ZBrush. Uh, but here, of course, for for the sake of this presentation, I, I show directly uh, uh, in KeyShot. Yeah. So that is one of the jets. You know, nice. And here we go, flying, yay. From chicken to airplane. Ship it again. <laughs> so here we go. I mean, uh, Yari, do you want us to switch uh, to uh, the defense of sci-fi? Sci do you want to do? Do you want me to do the demo? I think we need like a little bit of like a demo, like a pause. So we'll do the essence of sci-fi. It's much more serious. That's why I said that. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay. okay great. So Let's do the essence of sci-fi. Um, the essence of sci-fi. So David and I obviously are sci-fi nerds, but what, I mean, David, help me out here. This is the joint presentation. What is the essence of sci-fi? What's it, what's it made for? What are we excited about when we, what does it get us to do? 
So, so we just did the very immature part of uh, the job. <laughs> and now we're going to really switch to the more mature part of the job. We're going to talk philosophy. And well, to me, sci-fi, I mean, is uh, what's great about sci-fi is that it's kind of a metaphor. It helps us digest some things that may be too tough for us to digest as a society and project ourselves in the future in something that's like, okay, well, it's not exactly here, so we are safe. You know? So there's a way to keep ourselves safe looking at concepts that, that are maybe too complex or too scary for us to accept. For example, if you took, take Alien, okay, or our Arrival, you know, the stress of for humanity to maybe one day cross path with another intelligence. And there's something that can be pretty stressful about that, you know, and the idea of it's difference. Interesting you say that. It's interesting you say that because the film Arrival has nothing to do with the aliens. I kind of, I kind of, it's about like pain and suffering and how they deal with the aliens. Get that? That's the thing. Is it? The underlying issue, I think, right, was pain and suffering from arrival. Like yeah, the aliens no. were in the background, they weren't really like the forefront. The one kind of funny thing is like about sci-fi. If I could say something funny about this, is that they always talk about an intelligent life on other planets. I asked a rabbi one time, "Hey, rabbi, you know, do you believe in intelligent life on other planets?" His response was, "I'm still looking for intelligent life on this planet." <laughs> So, so that's what I mean. That's what it does, you know. Sci-fi, like you know, as you're saying, it's it's it gets us to 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 even question everything from like what is beauty? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And by the way, that is um, in, the, in that uh, this frame over here. That is uh, Rick Baker, Monster Maker. He did a sequel to the uh, he on his YouTube channel. He did a sequel to Eye of the Beholder. If you guys want to go check that out, it's in his YouTube channel. Anyways, continue, David. So yeah, I mean, you want to go to the next slide or? Yeah, can... sure. So the, this project came to us during the pandemic, during kind of a slow period. And um, it's still, you know, something that we're working on, you know, kind of on the side, um, but it takes place far in the future and humanity, you know, prospers and it's, you know, simply known as the one and they moved away from earth and, you know, humankind is on the cusp of achieving this next great leap forward, right? Lil and Kane are explorers, and route to Aiden, an abandoned, uninhabitable planet once known as Earth. And um, here are the models for them. And uh, a big shout out to Joe Grunfest for uh, consulting on these models for us and helping us. Um, so as I was saying, oops. So we concepted these characters right out. They're, we don't see their faces for the entire presentation. We don't get an idea that they're humanoid. We're just seeing that shaded tinted glass. And, you know, we don't even see hands. You know, we see these mechanical bits. So next slide. So, right, you know, there's this group of structures that they get to and they find a dilapidated earth that has constant dust storms. They don't know what these particular, they see malls and everything, but they don't know what these structures are for. They have no idea, right? There's evidence, right, that it indicates a time of great division you know, amongst the, in this planet that they haven't been to hundreds, if not, I think, I think it's hundreds of years at this point. And, uh, you know, they conflict evidence and mass murder in these locations that they find. We'll come back to that slide in a minute. Um, yeah, you know, they, they come to these locations that are now just in, you know, ruins and they put the pieces together and they uncover the Holocaust. So the questions that they raise are, how did a society allow this horror to happen? How did these perpetrators choose who to murder and why it was, you know, why was this history erased from the annals of, of human history, right? So they get into this conflict of, you know, one, one wants to bury this discovery and the other one wants it, to share it with their home world. David, do you want to chime in on this part about the conflict? Um, no, go ahead. You're doing good. <laughs> <laughs> so descent is dangerous. And, you know, is dissent necessary to keep us safe? That's like the conflict here. So if we kind of roll back a little bit. Oops, sorry. Let's talk a little bit about how ZBrush was used to put this together. Page down, I think, is it? So in this frame over here, many people have no idea what this structure is. And I didn't, at least when I first saw it. Why? Because the Nazis actually destroyed most of these gas chambers before the end of the war. And I needed to know what the stuff actually looked like. So I consulted a Holocaust survivor himself, Joseph Lefkowitz. Now, I, he actually was a slave laborer and he built the camps of Auschwitz-Birkenau, you know, forced to build these camps. So I had to ask him, 
how did these, how did this structure actually, you know, put together? And he gave me, you know, it was during the pandemic, so I couldn't go see this 93 year old man who's now alive and happy and has a very big family. This barcode over here is a um, link to his uh, documentary that was made about him. What he was famous for is after the war, he actually hunted um, Amon Goethe, who was this Goit, I believe that's how say his name. He was the uh, guy that was depicted in the film Schindler's List. This is the guy that actually found him and hunted him down. But, you know, he made it his business to do that. So he gave me a virtual tour of Auschwitz over, uh, over um, Zoom. And it was really impressive. And he showed me how to build the structure. And um, I built it using the um, micro poly mesh features, the array meshes, and just um, arraying this basic pattern around and putting it together quite quickly. So this was really, really cool um, to be able to build this stuff. So where ZBrush kind of also kind of comes in handy for me anyways, is when I have a very large scene, let me just bring back my scene here. When I have a very large scene, I don't work exactly the same way David does, but I can put a scene in here with millions and millions of polygons. Let me just break it up over here. Here we are. And what I tend to do is I bring out my space mouse and this was actually a really great feature that they had put in at the time. And I could literally just go in there and navigate the scene and ask a director, you know, do you want this camera angle? Do you want that camera angle? But I put everything in the scene together because the scale stays the same. I find if I build something in ZBrush and bring it back into a different application for rendering purposes, I lose scale. So this way I block everything out. And especially in other applications, like if you're trying to sculpt on something or do something, that you know, you have a 14 million polygon object in there, it's just not gonna, you know, your system, no matter how powerful, it's not gonna handle it too well. Suffice to say, ZBrush can handle a lot of data. And uh, that's how it was used on this project. This is a very short present. David, do you wanna add anything to the closer of this of this discussion? No, I think I think that's uh, what you're talking about is great because I mean, first of all, in feature film, ZBrush is used. I mean, not only for creatures, of course, but for environments. I would say that now it has become a norm for us to exchange a lot of files in ZBrush because of the sheer amount of polygons you can uh, manage. Uh, it's great for us to do even just environment sketches and things like that. Uh, but more importantly, what I think is very key about this project is that how often do we get to use uh, 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 3D tools and our skills, skills that we developed for years for a project that has a very deep meaning and humanistic meaning. Uh, and I think that's what we're trying to do. When the director contacted us to work on that uh, short film, we were fully game for it because we thought, okay, this is a way that we can use our skills to do something more meaningful, uh, which I think uh, uh, is something that some, is sometimes hard when people look at the work we do, there's something very superficial about everything that we do. So how can we use the same skills in order to do something deeper and more meaningful? Yeah, yeah. I'd, say, I'd say that, that that's, really, that's really the essence of it. The way that I see our company is that if you know, you've seen the film Ferrari versus Ford, you kind of have an understanding of it. You know, Ford raced cars so it could sell cars. Ferrari sold cars so it could race, and we like to race. And so when we, you know, when we're we very do, cool. Right? <laughs> uh, Luigi only follow the Ferraris. Okay. So, um, so yeah. So, um, yeah. So do you want to, you want to move on to the next part of the presentation or I can show yeah, us? Hold, um, Yuri, hold yeah. on. Someone wants you to put the barcode up again really quick so they can scan it. They didn't get a chance. Uh, the, uh, yeah, okay, a documentary. Yeah. Can I tell them to scrub it later? Okay. Okay. Cool. <laughs> so, uh, second here. There it is, it's over there. Oh, one second. It was here. It's a really great two hour documentary. This guy was a real Nazi hunter, not like the kind you find on Netflix. He was the real deal. He found a lot of them and testified against and them too. Do we have any, love do, we, do we have any news? Do we have any news about the, the short film and where it stands right now? This particular project, Descent? Yes. This project. Um, they're, they're, they're in the works of doing something right now, but it's still kind of tentative and they're kind of reworking things and retooling things. They gave me permission to show this now and that was really nice of them. So, um, I want to, you want to, you want to jump right into the, uh, some bullying, some, uh, some bullying? Yeah, it's your turn. You have, anything to show? you have anything to show? Okay, cool. All right. So, here we go. Thanks for showing that code again. No problem. All right. So yeah, everything has to start with the slideshow in ZBrush. So 
I met this guy. His name is Nick Pugh. If you guys know, if you guys don't know him, he is the evolution of Sid Mead. I'm, I only met him one time in my life and that changed everything. I didn't know who he was until later on when I saw some of the same drawings being put online like 12 or 13 years later. Um, but I'd, he has I'd say that anyone who calls himself a designer needs to learn about Nick Pugh. That's what I would say. Nick Pugh does everything I love from the creature to environment. I mean, yeah. if you guys go look at, by the way, this, this drawing, what I love about this thing, this is a cover to concept design too. That is not a 3D render, that's painted. He has a whole TED talk on digital painting. He is a master. His car, the Zeno, um, which is the car that I, is inspiring me for this demonstration, which we'll see in a minute. Um, his car is entirely um, about nanotechnology and 3D printing. All, most of the parts that you see, are, see there are, are 3D printed sometime in the, in the late 90s to early 2000s. And uh, this car is on display there at the Peterson. Go check it out. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, let's go to the next slide here. All right, I'm gonna talk about the, just the top three. This is from Scott Robertson's presentation of proximity-based styling, but I know you character people are watching this as well. It actually also applies to characters. So what is proximity-based styling? Basically how something reads when it is at a, you know, a distance from you or when it's close up or you know, when it's lit differently will give you different opportunities for design. Um, today, we're just gonna focus on the top one, which is silhouette, proportion, and stance. And what does that mean? Well, if you take the X-wing, which is the, you know, the obvious, the X versus the H of the TIE fighter, um, you have contrasting shapes. And so that's the thing that I focused on with this specific demo um, that we were gonna do. So again, I'll just kind of repeat, you know, wash, rinse, and repeat, as they say. This is our, this is the way that we work. We start with a hull shape your basic hull shape. And then we go and we do, you know, some basic sculpting and deformations, and then we can add surface detail in there. Now, um, you know, we have some other shapes that you can use the radial rays or get cut lines. All right, so without further ado, here's my model. Let me just bring it up over here. Let me hide, there it is, it's so pretty. Let me just hide my slides. Okay, cool. So let's bring back my interface and let's do a live Boolean. So everything you're seeing here is live Boolean and it is beveled actually using the live Boolean system. And what do I mean by that? Let's take a good look here. Let me just move this over here. Come back. All right. It's a little bit slow because it's streaming. I'm on a Mac. So, um, so the, um, the bevels here are all generated with the plugin that I work with Pixelogic in the testing of, um, you know, it's called Bevel Pro. You guys seen Paul demonstrate it the other day, but this is how I use it. Let me just zoom out and give you guys a better look at the actual car itself. So this car is an AI driven F1 racer. The reason why I say it's AI driven is because like combat, right? When we use, you know, like robots and things to do things, we can, they can do things in some ways, you know, better than a human being can. Um, through programming and whatever. Um, so I thought this would be a fun concept to tackle. So um, let me just kind of give you guys a little turn around the car. So I use live booleans as a design tool. I use it um, in the actual cutting of my shapes. Um, I use it in the, um, you know, in the very early phases. So let's build up and let's go and let's tackle one little piece at a time until I get told to stop. So here was the base shape that I started with. And it has no, let me just hide the other folders real quick. We'll go through here like little piece by piece and we'll kind of like put it all together. All right, so let's turn off, so so cool. So now we'll just show that top piece and I'll get rid of that rear wheel. Rear wheel is where I am. Okay, cool. So uh, let me turn off the uh, axle system back there, right over here. Okay, cool. So <clears throat> what you're looking at here, let me just turn off live balloons. So you can see how I, even the vents, if I just go back and turn on my balloons, even the vents are cut in using live balloons. See, it's actually rendering there. I'll show you guys how to put this together. Even the cut lines on the body, for some reason, is snapping behavior there. 
So let's show you guys where the negative shapes are being cut into as well. There's something I can show as well. Um, so those are the cuts that we're making that were generated through Bevel Pro. And they are, the, they are the pieces that actually run around the surface and flatten it out where I want it to. So let's take a look at a piece over here. So let's turn off all of the little bevels there. So that's what it looks like with just straight booleans. And let me just go back to this for some reason. Oh, I know I have perspective turned on. Turn off the foreground. Okay, cool. So as you can see here, the polygroups, let's just focus on this piece. So the way that Bevel Pro works is it's driven through polygroups. So when you polygroup something, you're telling Bevel Pro, this is a border by right, which you're going to respect and which you're going to actually run a bevel along. So when I processed this tool, initially it gave me this result here. And then it generated this little it's this little piece over here that ran around the edge. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to stop for a second. But do you realize, I mean, the techniques that, I mean, it just blows my mind. You know, having grown up with like spheres and cubes, that we are able to take a freaking object, apply a deformer to it, and then having a bevel done almost on the fly. I mean, it, this is just pure happiness. As a designer, this is heaven. I just wanted to just interject that. <laughs> Young kids probably don't care, and they're like, and then what, you know? But for yeah, me, yeah, so it still blows so my mind. What I'll do here, mm -hmm. what I'll do here is I'll actually run through just a couple different parts here. Um, I'll go with the grill as well, because I, you know, we'll, um, we'll bring that into play. I just don't want to run the process of light balloon. It takes a little bit of time and patience. Um, all right, there we are. So there's my light balloon. So light boolean is handled through the rendering system in ZBrush. So what you're looking at is a rendered result, and then you have to actually process the light boolean. Um, the actual beveling process is actually quite intense. And the way that you're gonna control it is through masking to tell it, I just wanted to focus on this area. And there's a really cool plugin I like to give a shout out to now, it's called Nix Tools. And it allows you to select multiple poly groups at once. Go get it, just Google it, it's called Nix Tools. I have no links for you. Sorry about this thing, it's just processing here. I'll probably do like one or two of these if we have time. Um, and that's also, I mean, what, what Yeri is showing as well is, it shows how important it is to be relatively organized when you're using booleans and your polygroups. Because if you stay organized and you stay clean and you can separate them into maybe your main masses and then your details and things like that, you can apply uh, uh, those bevels to certain areas and keep, uh, and keep uh, the rest for details. Uh, exactly. So we have this over here. Now, normally people in, uh, you know, who use polygroups They'll actually come in like this, they'll mask it, right? And they'll off-click it, right? But with this plugin, you just hover and you just tap where you want it to go. And that's really, really, really cool. So um, I just I didn't wanna... know that. I didn't know yeah, that. You can... It's, it's called called a secret tool. for me. I told you about it. You were listening. But, you know, the, um, the... They shared it in the chat. They shared it in the chat. I got to share it in the chat. Awesome. Okay, cool. All right, cool. So when you're bullying... You just want to make sure you have really good geometry back and forth. I don't know how this will work, but we'll see what happens. Cross our fingers. Um, so I masked that one that I want, and I in, and I inverse it. Now it's important to notice that um, the polygroups that I have there, it's going to create bevels that actually run on the inside, and I don't want that. So I'm going to actually just drop my mask here. Let me just click here in the open. Oh, why is it still masking? Oh, I know I. Very good. So we're just going to make this one polygroup so the polygroup runs along the edge. Let's just go here and let's process this. All right. So now we're going to go into Bevel Pro. So Bevel Pro is, you know, when it's processing, it's for me, you know, because it's GPU based, I have a MacBook Pro from 2018. It's sometimes bevel slow, but it's actually pretty good. Um, you know, if you have a pretty decent, uh, this actually doesn't perform so badly. But if you have a much faster GPU, it's, it um, goes a bit faster. So um, here we are here. So this actually is generating a really cool bevel where that polygroup is. Now, uh, Paul went through all of the functions of how this stuff works. But I'll just tell you the functions that I use the most. So I use bevel amount. And that just determines, obviously, the bevel amount. And what you're looking at there is you're looking at um, that's where your your edges, your middle edges, and then the, the red lines on the outside, that's your bevel. 
that's your bevel width. And the red shaded area, that is the area that the mesh that we're using, let me preview edges here, that is the, that is the, that is the area where the mesh that's being generated is covering. And if it isn't covering it, like if I come over here and I reduce this amount, you'll see that there's areas over here where it's not punching through. So you can use the mesh offset to clip it. And that's all we're doing. The um, bevel smoothness, if I just turn that down, oops. Oh, I think so I someone is asking. Mac, someone, it's a Mac, it's a Mac. I think someone is asking in the chat if we can change the, the shape of that bevel. So, and yes, yes. Yeah, you, you can change, you cannot change the profile. It's just a straight, Bevel, but what you can do is you can round out and smooth where that transition is taking place. So this is a tighter bevel, and you can see that, that you can focus on this area over here. And this is this area over here is the is the um, this is where it's going to run that smoothing along it. The other thing that I use is sharp. Now, what sharp does um, is when you have a harsh transition, it actually makes that bevel go from let's say a curve that's going inverted. So you have like a negative, which I'll show you guys in a minute. Um, but here's the bevel. So we're going to be like thieves here. Uh, there's two things you can do. You can auto apply, which is actually going to have to render twice, once for the bevel and once to render it in preview. And uh, let me just show you this over here. Okay, cool. So, so, so that works. So if I applied it like this, it's going to apply it to the mesh itself, but I want to just get that piece. So I'm going to click on okay. And it's going to generate me this piece of geometry. Now it's obviously going to just drop it right over here, and we'll just take a look at this. So there, isn't that special? That's special. <laughs> I have that. Isn't that That's special? awesome. That's special. So let's let's check out the front grill because this is cool. That's all that there is in the front, and um, you know I put some little like creasing. Thanks to Paul, uh, I put some creasing in there. But really, let me just. Um, Let's go ahead here. I'm going to actually just bring in. You know, and, what, and what's good about that technique in general? I mean, even before Bevel Pro, I mean, uh, just with the blue line works great. But with Bevel Pro, I did to that. It's like cherry on the cake. And what's good about that is that you can keep, especially when you're working in a production environment, like high pace production environment, you always want to keep your iterations. But you want to keep your basic mesh because you know that they're going to ask it. <laughs> ask for it, okay. and they're, sure. they're going to ask like five versions of the same uh, uh, design. So having the ability to always come back, I mean, it's just such a great thing, you know. So we'll we'll focus in on some key bevels in just different parts, but um, I'm going to make it fast, and I, I don't want to always jump back into the plugin. So the first thing I did here is I obviously made a cut right with with Bevel Pro that actually just. As you saw what David did with his um, computer screens, we just punched it right in in a negative shape. And then what I did on top of that is I needed to fake it because there's no way that Bevel Pro is going to go from a positive to a negative. So what I did, and this is cheating, but that's fine, Paul. It's cheating. Um, it's design. It's design. It's not cheating. It's design. It's okay, design. I'm just going to look at this, you guys. So what you can do in you know ZBrush, you can you can. Uh, it's very hard to. Um, like, uh, you know, to uh, separate things, but it's very, and by the way, I use the uh, Z modeler tools a lot. I, I'm a Polygon Jedi, so from, you know, I, that I inherited from my master, Taryn, right? You guys uh, are just throwing the terms out right now in this demo. Oh, oh stop. <laughs> Holly <laughs> Butcher. So, <laughs> yeah, so what you can actually do, what I did is I um, simply just eliminated the top half, so it created a perfect, um, a perfect curve you know, a perfect uh, finish. And then I just use the knife tool. Let me bring it over here. Here's the, here's the negative. So you can see it here. I use the knife tool and just cut it off right there. So it, it went negative really fully around that shape. And I just trimmed it where it needed to be. And, and these are all the meshes from lot from bubble pro everybody. Yeah. But yeah, check it out. I even have positive. What I also did is I, let me just hide some stuff here is I also, um, I'm this laughing the at the I'm the, at the comments, by the way. I totally need the uh, I totally need the V1, V2 things because I hate running through a list, but uh, that's just me. Um, where did you go? I can't find you. You know, I'll just go like this. So there we are. It's my intersection. Okay, cool. Um, 
I think the one, most wonderful thing about using the Boolean, though, is that you can easily make these adjustments based on what a director might want to see with scale or size. It's That's so exactly fast. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So I want. So I have and a set. It's not descriptive here. because it's all in the folder. Yeah. Sorry. So I have a set of positive bevels here that I generated from Bevel Pro, and I did that with the, with using the following um, means: is that I actually created. Um, let's take a look at over here. Um, you'll notice there's, there's polygroups over here. So essentially, it's going to create a bevel for wherever this wherever this this thing is processing. And I needed that positive shape in there because what I was looking to get is like little bevels that ran around the actual grill itself. There would have been it would it would have been very tricky to actually model the stuff in there. However, with Bevel Pro, you can make those transitions happen and you can show those things. So I wanted that. And I wanted on top of that little bevels that would actually run around there and give me what I needed. So it's pretty powerful. The, you can see where it stops it there. So I even created bevels along these edges as well, just by hiding polygroups. Um, the other thing that I did, which was kind of cool, is the thing next to the grill, which is this intake. So if this is that shape of that F1 racer, and I did it a bit more chiseled and beveled. I did a rounder version that didn't really get, it got shot down by David, got shot down, um, shot down like a dog. So the, uh, over here, back to the future reference, no one knows. Okay, so what I did over here, let me go to the Boolean system here, that's actually punching it through, is I took our some of our bevel shapes like this and I bent them along the curve. It's very important that if you're not getting good geometry in this situation, you should remesh what you're, you should remesh our mesh like over here. If you need more geometry to grab this piece, what you can do, hit F4. Um, that's what I do. I hit, I signed F4 to Nix tools. You can do it as many, you can do it as many tools as you want, invert that mask. Now I'm living in this kind of inverted mask situation. Hit W, bring up the remesh by Z remesher. And this is kind of really one of my favorite things to do. I use the Z remesher because it creates really good topology is I can just bring up that, I can just bring it up and I can really just crank it. That's <laughs> using the flat material when it does that. And that's uh, that's kind of important because the tools, the Boolean tools that we created and that we use in general and, and are, so are very, very optimized, are, are extremely optimized so that you have a fast frame rate when you're Booleaning like hundreds of them on one object. Uh, but you can also uh, single them out, apply a zero measure like you did so that you can curve them and, and bend them. You, you can really apply really, I mean, very surprising shapes uh, coming from that. See that? And then, I, and then over here, I have bevels and bevels on bevels, which is really cool. I like bevel pro and then beveled bevel it again. Just like... Bevel inception. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so these panels over here were drawn with the mask extruder brush. And it was really cool. I just dragged a bunch of rectangles and cut them out. So with the knife tool and I was like, yeah. Um, I wanted very subtle little panel lines here. And again, I want to thank Joe Grunfast for consulting on the idea of how we're going to, how I was going to accomplish this. He also um, gave us did some testing on uh, Bevel Pro. So it's really cool. I'll show you guys another bevel in the rocker panel. So with F1 racers, you got to keep them on the ground, you know, because it doesn't take much to get, uh, to get air. So this is a bevel that Paul was like, yeah, I, but Bevel Pro is just not going to let you do that. And I was like, I'm going to show Paul. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make this awesome. And said, uh, I'm going to break it. <laughs> I'm going to break this thing until it works. So I spent like hours, like, like trying to get this thing to work, but it did eventually. Let me show you guys here. So I have um, over here, like I show you that without the uh, balloon shapes. So I have like a big cut that's going in there for that main shape. And then I have these other little cuts. In fact, I'll turn on transparency mode so they can see it. Let's see what the transparency would do it with wireframe. Would that do it? Yeah. So I have that big shape punching into it there. And then I have a copy of these little arrows that are beveled into that surface. And what I'm getting is I'm getting a shape. Let's just highlight that shape so you guys can see that glorious running track here. I'm getting a shape that runs around that surface, right? that would be not be possible to bevel a surface like that that has that many changes in direction and the same thing for the vents and anything else that you see here as well the um show you guys another cool use for bevel pro on the front end so i really feel like now like if david asked me for a model that has a lot more polish and finish on it you know i can simply just make all my boolean cuts 
run double pro and go home to the kids, you know, <laughs> and I mean, that is, that is the coolest thing. So I have and to, that's the goal Scott. that we're all trying to achieve. That is I have true. to thank Scott Robertson for giving me some tips on this airfoil. So thanks to him. He actually sat with me and explained to me how some of this stuff works. I'm like, okay, that's cool. So he's taking me to school again. I'm like, checks in the mail. Yeah. So, um, this surface over here is kind of cool. It's better to see it without the booleans. So I have these surfaces that, again, I just drew from this shape and just round it out. And then I wanted to run a bevel along that edge. And I and I was able to do it through Bevel Pro. Um, the, um, the other thing that I did as well, let me just grab here, if I can just zoom in. Um, you guys can get a really good look there. So I have little tiny little, little, little bevels that run around this edge over here. There's some drawing errors. Bevels. Pardon, what'd you say? Yeah, itty bitty bevels. But they catch the light. Yeah, they're yeah. important. They, they do. You gotta That's have a this kind of point. stuff for light. But you know why really bevels are there for in reality, why we put them on objects? So you don't cut your finger. That's why we put a bevel on something. Every surface in the light that you're grabbing, whether it's iPhones, has been like, you know, beveled out. That's how the world is bevels. You know, there's no really sharp surfaces. Even knives have a small little bevel on them. But that's why we do that there. Um, on, you know, um, so, you know, certain things like racers and things like that, when they put these vents in there with their bevels, it's so the airflow kind of just keeps it to the ground. Um, so one of the cool things is being able to do um, not just positive cuts, but you know, not just negative cuts, but the positive. And the way that it leaves the positive, it's kind of interesting. Like over here, um, this transition here, there's actually a piece of geometry that was left. Let's see if I can bring it up here. Right there. This is a positive piece of geometry that it just sticks in there, you know? Um, and that's that's that's, what, that's all generated from Bevel Pro. Um, I could jump back into the, to the plugin to show them one thing. And then I think I'm gonna hand it back to David. But um, if I could speak to the design of this thing, it actually, um, actually really works well. Uh, Scott actually gave me, so we're gonna make this project for you guys. For We're gonna give this project away and our other project that we have of the airship that maybe you can bring up, David. And uh, we are giving all these models away for free on our gun road for you guys to go and play out. It'll probably be done after the summit. Um, but uh, yeah, this will be for free for you guys to go and play with and uh, yeah, check yeah, out. You, you, you guys can just show up on our gun road and the, the link is being given in the in the comments and you will have uh, access to those models. It's up right there. It's in a perfect spot covering me. <laughs> awesome. ABK, right? It's the floating so, hat. Uh, Follow okay, the floating so hat. Follow the floating hat. Someone called That's us really DV and Bevel, I think. <laughs> so, so I just want to show you guys. So on these hubcaps and stuff, and this um, this this is the break here. And by the way, I want to thank Paul for helping me with that, with with, with getting this all stuff to work out here. This is all done with the ray mesh, you guys. There's nothing here that is like, there's just like one row of four. Let me just see if I can select it. Find okay, it. there we go. And then even the little pieces on the inside are, and then we have, of course, Bevel Pro that runs along there and gives us this. But the really cool thing is the, is the hubcap itself because I have little, little bevels. Oh, gosh. So, oh, no. <laughs> Another inception of bevels. <laughs> Stop no, I just said another exception of bevel. Stop with the beveling. Um, see, that's showing you that it's a rendering issue. So the um, the uh, it's just intense when it has to render this much stuff. So of course, okay. of course, the, and it's the amount of so you that you have is. Here. I'm gonna go obscene. over here. I'm gonna grab this stuff here. One second. Come on, you. So there's that cut that goes right through it, and then on the edge, so if I can select it. Come on. Like a puppy here. Okay. Yeah, because it has to redraw this thing. But I actually I can actually just go through the list here and grab it. So the negative shapes that it's actually making. So here is the negative shapes for the um, for the wheel well for the excuse me, for the up there. Where is that thing? Yeah, you get you get into a lot of sub tools here when you do these kinds of things. But nonetheless, nevertheless, you guys can see where all those cuts are making. I just don't want to take the time, the precious time that we have here to grab it out. So let me bring back everything here so you guys can take a look at this thing. 
Um, but yeah, this was a fun project, I would say. The suspension's all in there too. It's all super accurate in there. We got the chassis in the frame. The, um, Scott actually gave me some of the pieces for the back, but you guys aren't gonna get those pieces. I took them out. So um, let's bring back the wheels. The there was a question going through about why not just use a dynamic subdiv bevel. I'll, I'll cover that in the next segment, why you wouldn't be able to do that. It's just not going to be possible. And I'll show well, you. They're, you're, you're not going to get it because it's going to make a fine cut. You know what I mean? Like even on these, even on these wheel covers over here to get that, to get that edge to really flatten like that along that curve is like impossible to do, to have a complete round go into a flat on this level. You're going to have to create a ton of geometry there where here I just use bevel pro along that surface. In fact, um, I can actually show them. I'll do one more round of bevel pro, and I think I'll call it um, this area over plus, here. Plus, it's I mean, in terms of how much time you're saving, I mean, of course. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, I think where was it over here? You yeah, got, you um, got ten minutes left. Twelve, twelve to be exact. Right. So over here. Sorry, I hit some button here. <laughs> one second here. You guys can hear me okay? Yep. You're fine. Did we lose audio? No. No, no, we, we can hear you. Maybe he lost audio, though. Maybe he it lost his like he did. AirPods, maybe, maybe his AirPods died. Oh. But maybe if you want, we can switch to. Yep. I'm we'll just going to give a little shout out to another project that we worked on. Yep. Uh, uh, that's called Finch. Uh, and I, I, of course, I cannot talk too much about it because of NDAs and things like that. Uh, so I cannot uh, reveal anything. But the only thing I want to say in relation to ZBrush is that in terms of design, I would say that there is nothing in this movie that wasn't done using ZBrush. <laughs> uh, I mean, ZBrush was really one of, I mean, our key tool uh, when it comes to designing uh, creatures, environments, and things like that. Uh, so I highly recommend uh, you guys have a look uh, uh, at the movie that's going to come out in two weeks. Uh, I know the production designer is probably watching this, so uh, uh, I don't want to do any mistakes. Uh, but uh, uh, it's, uh, I would say that is probably one of the most meaningful movie we had to work on uh, and that I had to work on for many years in terms of the message it's trying to convey and things like re relative to artificial intelligence and, and humanity and things like that. So I highly recommend uh, uh, watching that movie. Uh, that's it for now. But uh, uh, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I was just gonna, I'm sorry, I was just gonna say, if I can finish the demo, just one, one point that I was making is that when you guys are doing bevels and with Bevel Pro, um, just the one thing I'm gonna mention, then we'll jump out here. We'll, we'll, I did we'll see an 80s here. reference in the comments, by the way, Ash. Uh, say, say again? I saw an 80s reference when you were doing <laughs> Johnny number five. Yeah, for sure. Most definitely, yes. That's for you, Jessica. Yeah. I, I'm so glad you couldn't resist. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Yari. So, yeah, so. Um, it's important that when you're actually making the, your shapes, when you're doing your bevels, that you can you keep in mind that um, let's see, sorry. it just doesn't. I see, like I, I see Alejandro there. Hello, Alejandro. <laughs> so um, I just was going to say that when you're making your bevels for Bevel Pro, give yourself some space on the edge, so you don't run over it. So you, you know your bevel has a certain width to go around. Um, give yourself that space in the planning phases. And so you might want to consider when you have to make a bevel that maybe you're gonna go a little bit um, wider than you would normally. Um, anyways, so uh, we have to what? We have another six minutes left in the stream. Well, I mean, if, uh, so if you, some people yeah. have questions as well. If you want. We can do some Q and A. Mm. Yeah, if, if mm. you want, or it's up to you, uh, Paul, how you wanna. Sure. Well, you guys got some time yet. Yeah, we started uh, about five minutes late, so you guys got until at least uh, eleven twenty. So you got another technically eight minutes. Okay. Do you uh, want to do the closer now, or do you want to do the closer in a few more minutes? You want to answer some questions? I think we don't have a choice. I think we have to stay. <laughs> <laughs> no, we got the little special surprise for everybody. And, and then for the uh, good question about, I'm assuming you're asking about the Bevel Pro, do, can you dynamically change the bevel size? Yes, that's the point of also Bevel Pro is you throw it in the system, you can keep changing that size and yeah. you don't have to commit in essence to what bevel. 
It's a non-destructive workflow if you want it to be. It can be both, destructive or non-constructive. I'm excited for Finch, too. That movie looks like an exciting movie. It's amazing. Um, okay, so um, what was I going to say? Should we show them where our office is located, David? Well, it's located. Oh, yeah, that's a cool idea, actually. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah. Get ready for this one. This is so, so, of course, we're all uh, working from different places in the world, like uh, a lot of people nowadays. Uh, but uh, one thing is sure is that uh, Yariv uh, location is pretty uh, visually pretty mind-boggling. Uh, it's good to see uh, Amy saying hi as well in the comments. Uh, you can share my screen. Okay, cool. There we go. So this is our studio here. I'll just get a good back. I, I feel like I'm in so, a first-person <laughs> game right now. Yeah. I know. So this is pitch dev over here. This is my draw. I have my. This is my table over here where I do all my work, all my digital stuff, and then obviously I draw. And I love to draw. I draw oh, every day. Awesome. Yeah. So I I think the drawing is very therapeutic and very cool. This is where another artist that we have that sits here, and uh, there's oops. Oh. Okay. Oh, there you go. Sorry. Okay. Cool. Aww. So I'll show you guys. This. Oh, so my my daughter might be a twelve year old drew this one, and uh, show you guys what's outside over here. Wow. So we are in the old city of Jerusalem. Wow. That's so hey, what's up, Yehuda? <laughs> <laughs> Zebra shirt on. Representing. Yeah. I think he's going a little too far yeah, from the sure. from the Wi-Fi. Oh, wait. oh no. I just love that you can just step outside for some incredible architectural inspiration. Look at what that. a view. Nice. That's my yeshiva over there. So okay, cool. Wow. That's, so that's that's the Western Wall. That's the Al Aqsa Mosque. That's the Dome of the Rock. Here we are. Wow. <laughs> very cool. That's very cool. Uh, thank you, Yari, for showing us uh, no what's outside your office. Yeah. Someone's oh. asking, how old is the building you're working in? This thing? Oh, gosh. I want to say it's a, maybe about 100 or so years old. <laughs> That's so cool. And someone asked also, I saw that, what would you, how would you recommend? Jump right here. How, how would you have... advise for someone living in Israel to get into the industry? Go, go see Yarif. That's a very good idea. Yeah. Wait, That's when he comes really back, idea. we can ask him. Yeah, not yes. totally. <laughs> so, um, uh, how I, so I'll answer that. Yeah, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Like, um, how are you, how did I get? I'm getting an echo. That's probably your other one. Oh. <laughs> One second. Wrong your files. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, you guys can hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. Cool. So to answer that question, um, there is a great school that's in Tel Aviv called, um, oh gosh, I think it's called the, Anima it's the AIC, the Animation College of Israel, I think, or something like that. Um, IAC, that's it. And they have a whole program for people who want to join the industry and start working in the industry in Israel. If you want to work abroad, I would say your best bets is to take online mentorships, not like classes, but like mentorships. It's going to cost a lot more money, um, but it's worth it to do a mentorship over a class because then, you know, you get that direct one-on-one -on -one attention. It's focused. You have a goal in mind. Um, that's my recommendation. No, and I mean, I feel like a part of your conversation was all about paying it forward just because of all the artists that took their time to, uh, you know, help you along when you were starting your career. I mean, really finding those inspiring people that invest in you. Mentorship is where it's at. Yeah. Most definitely. Neville being, I think, one of the next presenters is a good <laughs> example of that uh, when it comes to inspiration. and. Uh, uh, yeah, he's up really to at uh, 12.45 Los Angeles time. That's awesome. So just an hour and a half from now. Yeah, we got. Uh, we'll have in between this one and that one. We'll have the tips and tricks segment, pew, pew. full of more. <laughs> I, like I don't know what this means, but we're going with it today. <laughs> we're Ashley's, Ashley's, right? So, guys, that was uh, that was awesome. That was incredible. Thank you for uh, again spending time with us to do that. Um, 
it was really great. Um, people really enjoyed what you guys were sharing. Uh, I think it was also inspirational too, not just full of uh, watching you work, but giving inspiration and giving ideas for people how to get in the industries as well. Yeah. And beyond that, also giving back, like here's, you know, the car. And then also we're going to let you take a look at it later on our gum road. And that's just really generous of your uh, ability and time. Yeah. We'll David, open it for free say, uh, today uh, over the day. Yeah. Yes? I just want to say, David, just to you, thank you so much for creating such a great company where people can learn from each other. You know, <laughs> uh, it's, I, it's so just, I'm doing my best in such business. Thank you. I feel embarrassed. <laughs> uh, but, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a battle. <laughs> Yeah, and they have their gum roads up again for them in the chat and right now on the screen too. And uh, their coupon code to get their brush packs, the to the summit, and uh, it's to the first fifty people, so twenty percent off. And Design Studio Press has their uh, has their has their twenty percent off on Scott's books and Ray Bustos' book. So yep. it's the C Brush twenty. I think it's C Brush twenty twenty one summit, and then it expires December thirty first. Wow, that's a great. Right December, sorry, not December, October 31st. I was going to say October, December. Wow. <laughs> we love you guys. <laughs> so, October, the end of October, that one's good the for October. the WordPress. It's late here. I agree with you. Those two books from Scott are a must purchase. If you want to do hard surface, even if you don't draw and you've just been doing sculptural stuff, you should be going to look at some of those drawing techniques. I'm telling you, you will take stuff from that and relate it into your 3D work 100%. So totally those, I have both those books on my shelf. I have yep. both. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of Scott's work. He's awesome. And fantastic here. instructor too. And yeah. Another yeah. fabulous instructor for sure. Well, uh, any last minutes that you guys like to share from your side? Oh, no, thank you so much for on? having us. I mean, this is excellent. You know, we're so, so happy to be part of this. Yeah, I mean, I love ZBrush. I use it every day. And, you know, for, for me, I think what it represents is that, um, you know, when I started this whole journey, it was never, it was always a technical task to model something. Taryn made it kind of really fun with his subdivision surface modeling. But then what really kind of spoke to me as an artist and related back to my foundations was the actual ability to sculpt. And nowadays, the ability to create in ways that I would have never imagined possible before using tools like um, Z modeler and light booleans and things that it just makes the whole process fun and more of a designer's tool that you know we can get out our designs very quickly, very rapidly, and uh, not have to go anywhere at other packages. We can do it right here, one one stop. Yeah, it is kind of nice to use ZBrush as like uh, every problem can be solved in ZBrush. I, it's very flexible and less scary. There's a lot you can do for sure. A lot of different ways. And though. PowerPoint presentations too. <laughs> You're right. A new Stop. one. <laughs> Actually, I tell you why I did it like that is because of the fact that I wanted to I wanted to have 3D models in my presentation, and I thought you know it's going to be so stupid to jump between um, two different tools. Let me just simply load up a plane and you know import a texture and go. And then there's a slider in there for transparency, and that's as simple as it is. And then you can just duplicate your squares and then it can be really cool you know i think you need to do a, i think you need a, a tutorial for everybody oh, no. yeah. uh, i want to learn that a mini gum no. road on presentation with 3d models uh, no, 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 well, no. we have a youtube channel uh, well, yeah by the way have, did you know that on zbrush right or no by the way uh regarding those booleans and things like that we have a youtube channel where all our uh, all our tutorial are there for free for viewing so uh, anybody oh, can wow. if anybody wants to understand again and more in details how to do those booleans it's all on YouTube. Yeah, the other thing I would say is the, the only, the most recent feature that I've been using in ZBrush a lot as a designer is the silhouette view that they have on by default. I don't know how many people use that feature, it's on by default, and that's what Pixelogic does, they put something on by default, so you'd have to turn it off if you don't like it, but that silhouette view always gives me a good idea of you know what my forms and what my silhouette, what my stance is of my um, design. and. Yeah, I don't think any other package does that, so that's really cool. I, it's surprising how much I use that, what you uh, just brought up. I use yeah. it a lot. That's it's a, thumbnails. That's like the yeah. essence of design and concept. Yeah, yeah instead of Once going, again, shapes and proportions. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, then you can still do a model in a 3D form and in a silhouette form, and I have to keep switching between the materials. I yeah. find it very helpful, actually for myself. Yep, same here. Um, I'm going to put the link. Someone was asking about Scott's books. So this is the website, um, yeah. Design Studio Press. 
Um, so Scott's, you can search for Scott's books in there. The one that um, he was bringing up specifically, let me see if I can find a link. Here we go. I really want to say that Scott is our kind of like our, our hidden father hovering above us at all time. And he's uh, not only an inspiration, but he's been a guide and always here. Uh, I mean, one of the, like you say, one of the best teachers out there, no yeah. doubt, hands yeah. down. Yeah, if you have a chance to learn anything, to take anything where he's going to speak or teach or anything, take it. Go. Coming back to teaching, I should tell you guys, he's 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 uh, he left his three-year um, job that he had, and now he's focusing on educational material. So there is a good chance that you know um, you know he'll be you know making his um, Scott Robertson workshops probably more often as the pandemic kind of lightens up. But uh, I'll tell you, if you ever get him in a brick and mortar setting, he's a really hard grader. He will make you work. So. <laughs> But you want that. You don't want anybody just to go easy on you. You're there to learn and there to get like the the in-depth critique of a hardcore but constructive exactly right. human being. Yeah, but like if I were to compare like like um, his style of teaching versus Neville Page, Neville Page is more like Mr. Miyagi, Miyagi do karate, and his classroom was run like a Cobra Kai dojo. You know, you really <laughs> you really had to be on your game. Is that is that right, Mr. Newman? I'd be like, yes, sir, it is. Uh, the um, the feeling that you were in a studio, like a real working studio when you were in his class was, um, you know, a feeling that people just don't get any other place. And maybe he'll come back to doing that at some point. But it, it's really a humbling experience to be in that class. I had him for four or five classes, so got a lot from him. The fact that you went back is testament. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, we got to do some giveaways and we're going to move on to the next segment. So guys, thank you so much. And by the way, one question came through. Are you guys hiring and how can people send the stuff to you? Uh, there are projects coming and we are hiring uh, all level of artists, uh, whether it's a junior or a higher level. We always are looking for talent. So and our projects are, are scale up and down. So we, we do work a lot with uh, as contractors, with people as contractors. But uh, as the company is getting uh, working on bigger projects, we are starting to hire more um, on longer term per, uh, basis. So yes, short answer. Can contact yes. you off through your website. Um, we're sharing your website right now in the chat. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's producing at Pitch Dev Studios, correct? Yeah, yeah it's producing at Pitch Dev. That's right. Okay. Guys, thank you so much again for taking time out of your day to yeah. be with us. This was awesome. Yuri, if you killed it, good job, buddy. <laughs> well done. Yeah. Yeah. I honestly, I honestly yeah. really got to get a PC because uh, I'm not so, or an M1 MacBook Pro, but somebody's got to bring it for me from America. Um, the uh, I must tell you, this has been such an amazing experience using Bubble Pro in my workflow. I, I, you know, it's just something that I, 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 it's like secondhand for me at this point. So I can't wait to see what people create when they get their hands on it. Yeah, I mean, ZBrush release is like Christmas in between Christmas. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> we try. We try. We try. Uh, All right, thanks, David, guys. thank you so much. And thank, thank you for you so giving much. us thank about you. another four zingers for people to use and put on Twitter. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Here you go. Right Stop. out the gate, you gave us like four of them. Yeah. I just did one with Christmas again. I mean, I'm yeah. sorry, guys. I just can't just stop it. Dropping things all over the place. Here. I love it. It's fantastic. All right. All right, guys, thank you so much. We're going to uh, do some giveaways back. Thank you again. Hopefully you guys can uh, stick with us and watch the rest of the streams. We still got three more sections going on here. And again, we're announcing the winners of the Sculpt Up at the end of yes. today, too. So we got a lot more to go on. Guys at Pitch Dev, thank you so much for being thank with you us. Thank you so much for we'll having us. See you later. Thank you. Happy progression. <laughs>